all I want to do is tell some stories and talk to you guys about this whole customer economy thing. And you'll find that it's incredibly simple. And I'm hoping we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, anything I say is shareable, is tweetable, is postable, is, is storyable. And you don't have to hide your phones. I'm not offended when you do I teach at a university in New York. I know when my students are on their phones. Because in the history of time, no one has ever looked down at their crotch and smiled. <laughs> so, so I'm at Peter Shankman on every social out there. Feel free to share anything I say. I'm flattered that you would. So why are you listening to me and why am I opening this incredible conference with a big shout out to the people that put it together, Vladimir. You guys did a great job. This is going to be an amazing conference, so thank you. So, I wasn't supposed to be doing any of this. I was in graduate school in the early 90s in Santa Barbara, California, studying fashion and portrait photography. It was a spectacular way to meet people. Specifically, for someone who had absolutely no, no experience and no game, it was a great way to meet women. I had a camera. Hi, can I take it? Yeah, it was just, I was pathetic, and I fully own that. In the United States, college is, costs a lot of money, in grad school even more so. And um, with 18 credits to go, I lost my financial aid. The government sent me a letter that said, your parents make too much money. We're taking away your financial aid. And I sent the letter to the government. I sent a, a letter back to the government that read, dear government, my parents do make too much money. They keep it. And the government did not find that funny. And so I moved back to New York City, where I was born and raised. And I was living in my parents' basement in Manhattan. And this was the, uh, I guess, the mid-90s. Um, raise your hands, please, if you're under 30. Wow. OK, so a lot of the shit I'm going to say here is going to make no sense to you whatsoever. It was 1995, I was in my parents' basement hanging out in something called the Melrose Place TV Gossip Chat Room <laughs> on America Online. If you imagine um, sending a Snapchat about the last episode of Game of Thrones, but it's not a phone, it's a, it's a, it's a box that sits on the floor and has a screen on your desk and is connected to something called a modem, M-O-D-E-M, which you can find on Wikipedia. And you would type something into this chat room, and you would go get a slice of pizza, and you'd come back 30 minutes later, and someone would have typed something back to you. And this is what we did in the 90s instead of, like, you know, dating. And so I'm in this chat room in my parents' basement. It is literally as glamorous as it sounds. And Someone in the chat room sent me a note that said, my company is trying to build a newsroom. Why don't you submit your resume? And I said, sure, I have a journalism degree from Boston University, and I have no experience whatsoever. I'll be spectacular for you. And I learned very early in my life that sarcasm does not translate well <laughs> online. And I bring that to you as a lesson. When you think something is funny and you bring it to your audience, chances are they are not going to think it's funny. And so I sent that message, and two weeks later, I was being moved down to Virginia to become the founding editor, one of three founding editors, of the America Online Newsroom. And this is in the, for those older than 30, AOL was the internet. Okay, when, when, we were, when we were just getting online, it was America Online. There was no modem, there was no Wi-Fi, there was AOL. And so it was, welcome, you've got mail, and then that little newspaper icon that said, today's news, and we built that. And in the two and a half, three years I was at AOL, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. We would go in every day and we'd do something, and if it worked, we'd do it again. And if it didn't work, we wouldn't do it again. And all I'm doing here today is telling you stories. And hopefully every story, you're going to see the point and maybe get a lesson out of those stories. Because I can come up here and make jokes all day, but if you're not learning stuff that you can go back and implement, then I've failed you. And so look for a lesson in every story I tell. We're at AOL, and this is during the, really the height of the internet starting, right? People are getting online all the time. And if you remember AOL, this was, again, it wasn't high speed. It was modems where you'd, anyone use AOL back in the 90s? 
And it, okay, so you remember, please wait, downloading art. So you'd log on, it would have to download the images. You'd go to sleep, it would be like 9% done, and you'd go to bed. And you'd wake up in the morning and it would say 91% done. And th every night, and that was our fault, and we're sorry. But the crazy thing was that we're, from where we were sitting in the offices, our stuff looked awesome. Because we were sitting on OC12 internet pipes, which were, the, at the time, the fastest internet connections in the world. Literally, the pipes came into our data center from Europe, from Asia. And so we were like, if we were playing Quake in real time at 3 a.m. with Japan with no lag, and we thought it was awesome. But we realized that everyone receiving our content was getting it on 1,200 baud modems or 2,400 baud modems, and our pictures of the OJ trial, and our videos of the 1996 presidential elections with Bill Clinton and all that stuff, while it looked awesome to us, it looked really terrible to them. And we couldn't understand why no one was sticking around and getting their news from AOL. And we learned that really valuable lesson. Here it is, you do not control the direction of your company or the direction of your audience. Your audience controls the direction of your company and where they want to go and how they want to get their information and how they want to receive it, you have to give it to them that way. And we'll get into how to knowing how they like to do that in a little bit. But if you're not listening to your audience and listening to your customers, you won't have a company to sell. You won't have anything to do. It is not about you. And it's a hard lesson to learn, but it wasn't about us. We were creating great content, but it didn't matter if no one saw it. It's like working out. You could do a 15-mile workout, but if you didn't post that shit on Strava and stare, share it with your friends and say, look what I did, did you really work out? <laughs> right? So it's sort of that same thing. We were creating this great content that no one could see, and we learned a really hard lesson. So AOL was probably the best experience I ever had. To this day, Steve Case and Ted Leonsis were the two most incredible bosses I ever had in my life, and only bosses I ever had in my life, and I learned so much from them. I left AOL, and I moved back to New York City. This was, um, I don't know, 97, 98. And I had this idea to start a public relations firm, right? The dot-com boom was starting to blow up and everything was starting to get popular and people were starting to get on. I figured that, that there had to be people that needed fast PR, right? And I could represent all these dot-coms and everyone was throwing money around. I had no money. It was the summer of 1998. And I'm like, I was living in a studio apartment roughly the size of, like, you. And in Midtown Manhattan, and it cost, at the time, $1,600 or $1,800 a month uh, in rent. I had $1,849 in the bank. And I'm like, how do I start a company on, on $49? And so I took my $1,800. There was a movie coming out in this, on video in the summer of 1998. It was an independent film. It didn't do that well. It was called Titanic. <laughs> Might have heard of it. it. Didn't. It was okay. Everyone knew how Titanic ended, right? So. I took my rent money, I took all 1800 bucks in the bank, and I had 500 t-shirts printed up, and the t-shirts read, it sank, get over it. <laughs> and I went into Times Square with my 500 shirts in like three boxes, and I figured if I could sell 180 shirts in a week at $10 a piece, I'd make my rent money back and I wouldn't be homeless. If I didn't, I was on the street. I mean, living with my parents, which I would have preferred the streets better when you're... And so, I went in on a Friday night around 6 o'clock. I figured it would take a week, and I sold 500 shirts in six hours. I made $5,000. I came home. I threw $5,000 up in the air, rolled around it naked. No matter what else you learn at this conference over the next three days, that's what you're going to take home as an image, is me rolling around in five... Yeah, so, good luck with that. So... <laughs> A lot of self-image issues here. <laughs> walked into the conference, you saw the trampolines? I literally walk in, they're like, Peter, welcome. I'm like, oh, trampolines. Like, no, 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 you're too heavy. I'm like, what the fuck? What? <laughs> so yeah, welcome to it. We're so glad you're here. You're fat. So that was nice. But um, so I sold these, these, these 500 shirts, and I called a reporter I knew when I got home at USA Today. And I said, I just did something really funny. I thought you'd get a kick out of this. And she goes, Oh my God, that's hysterical. Are you, so, so what now? You're selling the shirts online? And I went, yeah. I mean, <laughs> duh. That's why I call. This was 1998. There was no cafe press. There was no WordPress. There was Peter and his craptastic HTML. Buy shirt, click here. 
You'd click to send me an email that you wanted a shirt. I would email you back my address, and you would mail me a check. <sighs> the reporter said, okay, that's really funny. We'll see what we can do. And I hung up the phone, and I immediately forgot about it. Um, because for those who don't know, who haven't read of me, I have ridiculous ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, I've been diagnosed. I actually host the number one podcast on iTunes about ADHD called Faster Than Normal because I personally believe that ADHD or any sort of neurodiversity, uh, any different brain is actually a gift. Anyone here ADHD or, or some sort of neurodiverse? Good. You're awesome. You're, you are incredible. And so I, I have massive ADHD. Everything excites me. Shiny objects are awesome. And the reporter said, we'll see what we can do. And I hung up the phone, and I immediately forgot about it. And the next morning, I'm lying in bed. It's 5 in the morning. The phone rings. It's the hosting provider of my website. Mr. Shankman, we're sorry to call you so early. Have you started advertising? It's 5 in the morning. What the shit? Why, why are you calling me? I don't know. Sir, normally you get about 100 visitors a day to your website. Most of them are you. <laughs> You've had over... Yeah, thanks. <laughs> You've had over 37,000 visitors in the past two hours. You've crashed our first, second, and third primary servers. You're about to take down our first, second, and third backup servers. Sir, we have nine servers in total. We'd like to know what's going on. I had no idea. I hung up the phone. As I was putting it back, it rang again. Peter, hey, this is Gary Delabate at the Howard Stern Show. Can you come talk to Howard? I don't understand. We want, you're in the city, right? Come to our studios. Can you come in the next like, hour and talk to Howard? I don't understand. <laughs> we want you to come on the show and talk to Howard. You want me to come on the Howard Stern Show? Yeah. Do I have to be naked? I don't understand. Why. you the guy who did the T-shirts. Oh, shit, the T-shirt. Everything started to make sense. The story ran on the front page of USA Today. It listed the website. <laughs> I did nothing. It was not me. Thank you. That's... I did nothing. I created the shirt. It ran on the front page. In two months, 350 media outlets around the world covered the anti-Titanic t-shirt story. And I sold a little over 10,000 shirts on the web at 15 bucks a piece. I cleared about 100 grand and started my first PR firm from some stupid idea. And so as you're sitting here, two stories in here, as you're sitting here, two lessons. The first lesson, no matter how dumb you might think your idea is, or no matter how many people might tell you that's ridiculous, it's stupid, you're going to get arrested, you're going to get deported, whatever they say, I've heard all those things. If you have an idea, the only mistake you can possibly make, that, that, the tr only real mistake, the only mistake that won't teach you, or that won't help you, is not doing it. Okay, so how many of you are entrepreneurs, have ideas, want to build something, want to create something? freaking do it. Don't let anyone, including me, tell you that you can't do anything. If you have a dream for it, do it. The worst that happens is you fail miserably, which I've done countless times, which all of us have done. You fail, you learn, you start again. That's how life works. That was the first rule. The second rule, and this is just as important, if I went out there today with a t-shirt in Times Square, you know what happened? Some idiot with an iPhone would take a picture of it. 20 minutes later, there'd be 15 different sites on Etsy selling my shit, right? I wouldn't make a dime. So brand everything you do. Everything that you create, everything that you build, everything that you put online, make sure there is a way to brand it back to you. Because today, in the age of deep fake and in the age of it's so easy, go to rip save, whatever it is, people will steal your content. If you do not know how to brand it back to you, you will lose. That goes without saying. Any, any triathletes, a random segue. Again, ADHD, I'm going to do a lot of segues. Any triathletes in the audience? Okay, I did an Ironman once, and shut up. I know you're looking at me going, no, you didn't, but I swear to God. You're like, no, you sat on your ass and watched the movie Ironman. No, I really, I did an Ironman. And I made a video about my experience of, of doing it, and I posted it online, and I didn't think anything of it until three days later when I found out that Lance Armstrong had... Uh, tweeted about it, and I had 200,000 views. That video is my most popular video on YouTube now. It has like 2 million views or something like that. It's called I'm Training for an Iron Man. But nowhere on there does it say, for more, go see shankman.com or find me at, at Peter Shank. I totally missed my chance. Brand everything you do. It is mandatory. 
So long story short, I started a PR firm. I ran it for several years. I sold it, consulted for a while, and then eventually I came up with an idea for something that I'm most well known for. It's a company called Help a Reporter Out, or Harrow, which still exists to this day. Essentially, I know a ton of people, right? When you're ADHD, you talk to everyone. If, if you're on a plane next to me, like, unless you fake your death, I'm going to know everything about you <laughs> by the time we land. It's just, it's just I mean, and only two people have ever faked their death. Um, so I know a lot of people, and I started this little email service with, for, for some friends. It basically, reporters would send me queries. Hey, Peter, I'm doing a story on whatever. You know people. Who, do you know someone who can answer this question? And over, like... Between 2006 and 2007, a lot of reporters got my name and started asking me questions, and I didn't know enough people. And so I started sending out the requests to my friends, figuring they could share them and, you know. Well, in a year, I, it turned into something called Help a Reporter Out, which by the time I, this was in 2007, by the time I sold it in 2010, Help a Reporter Out was a 500,000 person mailing list that three times a day, I was sending out three emails a day, or 1.5 million emails a day, double opt-in, all, all spam free, emails a day to 500,000 people with um, about 75 queries in each email. If you were knowledgeable in something the reporter wanted, you simply replied to the reporter's request and you got quoted in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, in Oprah, in whatever. Because the one, you had to open the email, because the one day you missed it, there was a reporter from a big publication doing a story about you, or doing a story about your industry, and you missed it, right? So you had to read every email. It was like email crack. And when you're sending out something that everyone has to read, you can charge a lot for those small little text ads you put at the top. And so I was sending out 1.5 million double opt-in emails a day with a 79% open rate. Yeah. And I damn well know I'll never get that again, ever, for anything I do. But at that moment, for those three years that I ran it, Harrow was pretty incredible. It wound up getting acquired by a company called Vocus, which is now Cision slash Business Wire, and um, it changed my life. And what I want to share with you, the basis of this talk about the customer economy, I'm not an MBA. I'm not a genius. I'm far from any of that stuff. I'm just a guy who did some good stuff and got lucky a lot. And I learned four specific rules when I was running Help a Reporter Out. And those four rules led to two books and led to my selling Help a Reporter Out for, for me, a life-changing sum. Um, and it really sort of changed my life. Everything I have is, is sort of traced back to the stuff I did. And so all I want to do is share with you the four rules and, and what I learned from running this company and selling them and how that relates to customers. And the, most, the easiest way to explain this to you is this. I don't know how it is here because I've been treated wonderfully so far in my 18 hours here in this, in this country, but I can tell you this, customer service, at least in the United States and most industrialized country, Europe and things like that, customer service sucks. Okay, we do not expect to be treated anything remotely close to good. Anyone flown recently? Anyone flown recently in the US? That's always a good question to ask. How was your flight? There you go. Anyone have a good flight recently? Anyone have a good flight? Wow, not one. Tom, what made your flight good? They looked after you. You took off on time. Land. Okay. okay. So Tom, when Tom went on his flight, he signed what's called a contract of carriage. When you buy your ticket, that's a contract of carriage. That means they're going to send you somewhere at a certain place in time, and in exchange, you will pay them for them to do that. That's your ticket. They didn't let Tom fly the plane, I'm guessing. Right? There wasn't a date sitting next to you at the next seat. It was just a regular flight. You took off on time. You landed on time. You didn't crash into the ocean, and they didn't pull you off the plane by your nose. Well, everyone was Facebook living it, right? Okay, so Tom had a perfectly normal flight, but in his mind, he looked after me really well. It was an awesome flight. Best flight ever, praise the Lord, because that's not what we expect. The bar for the customer experience is so unbelievably low that anything remotely better than crap we consider incredible. Let's face it, Tom's expectation, and I know where Tom lives, so chances are he went to Newark Airport, and he got to Newark Airport, and he went to the one security line that looked the, slow, looked the fastest, right? And it was pretty fast until he got there. For some reason, he looks like a terrorist. 
I don't know why, it's probably the hair, but he looks like a terrorist. So they pull him into this private little room. An hour later, he comes out, pulling up his pants, a little less, little less self-love there. Now he only has 30 minutes to make his flight, but it's okay, because his gate is right there. It's gate four. <laughs> Except, no, no, they changed the gate. They just didn't tell Tom. Now Tom is at gate 287, which is six airports and four states this way. So Tom is now running across the airport. His carry-on is falling out, all his luggage is falling out. He's had four mini heart attacks. He gets to gate 286. The door's still open, so he'll make his plane. He was in seat 3B, right up at the front of the plane. No, 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 no. He gave that up by not being there a half an hour early. Now he's in seat 34 bathroom, which is in the back of the plane, next to two very large gentlemen on either side of him in a middle seat, and there's some blue liquid running out of the bathroom from the back of the plane down between his legs. That's his next five hours. If that's what he expects, and all they did was not that, all they did was fly him where he wanted to go and he made it on time, that was the best flight Tom's ever had. So here's the thing, guys. I don't need you to be amazing. I've interviewed Tony Robbins. I've interviewed all these success gurus, right? And they, they go, let's walk across fire and release our internet. I'm not going to make you do any of that shit. That shit is hard. That's not necessary. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn the tools to be one level above the worst thing that people expect, which is standard. I want you to essentially, I want you to be one level above crap. I don't even need you to be great. Let's start there. And you think I'm kidding, but the expectation is so low that anything better than that will win you all of the things, all of the people, all of the audiences. So how do we do that? Four basic rules. First rule is the concept of transparency. Here's what transparency means in a nutshell. Transparency means that you are going to screw up because you're a human. When you screw up, own it. All you have to do is own it. A study came out a couple of years ago, I think it was out of Stanford, it might have been on the East Coast, I don't remember, but it was a university study that said that 81% of people, when they have a problem with a company, expect the company to lie to them as opposed to try and fix their problem. 81%. But here's a fun corollary. 71% of people who complain on Twitter don't need their problem solved. They're, getting their problem solved isn't their first requirement. What's their first requirement? Being listened to. Exactly. They want to know someone is hearing them. When I'm on the runway at, on, on a United flight, I'm heading to the West Coast or something, and I see a giant cloud in the sky, and we're not taking off, I'm pretty sure it's because there's a storm. But unless the pilot comes on and tells me, my brain's going to go right to, well, a wing's going to fall off, we're all going to die. Just be honest. People expect companies to lie to them. The concept of owning your mistakes, there's a, a, a word for this that I always forget, where it's a customer who gets screwed by you but then fixed has a higher loyalty to you than a customer who was never screwed by you in the first place. Think about that. Customers who you make mistakes with, as long as you fix that mistake, will have a higher loyalty to you than customers who you've never made a mistake with before. Why? Because the second you fix their problem, they have an intimate connection with your brand. I was sending out 1.5 million double opt-in emails a day, and you know what email address they all came from? Peter at Shankman.com, the same email I have now. The week before Christmas, my entire day, literally my entire day, was spent deleting, three times, was spent deleting 900,000 out-of-office inbox emails from my inbox. 900,000 out-of-office inbox emails every single day. But it was worth it. Because if you had a problem with the service that I was giving, or you had a question about a reporter, you just hit reply. And you got me. People ask, what's your job? What was Harold? What were you doing? Like, well. I was sending emails and replying to emails, and that was literally my job for three years. But you got a reply from the founder and CEO of this company, right? You get these emails now that say, we really care about your experience. Please tell us about your experience so we can make it better for you. But don't reply to this email. Click this link or we'll kill your family. <laughs> literally, the email replies come from do not reply or we'll murder you at united.com or whatever. But we care. There's a juxtaposition there. How can you care and not let me talk to a human being? 
And I'll give you an example of that, talking about transparency. So I do fly United Airlines a lot. Like, I'm, about, I'm on a plane about 250 times a year. And when you get to that level of flying, United tends to, all the airlines do that, they send you a survey after every flight. You have a status level, right? And they send you a survey, tell us what you can do on your next flight. And, and I usually check, oh, it was fine, the flight was fine, the Wi-Fi didn't work, but I expect that because you're United. And every time, the last line of every email, every time they sent me the survey, the last line was the same, on, our next, on your next flight, tell us what we can do to make it even better. And so I started a little study for two 174 survey answers in a row, I wrote the same thing. On my next flight, please refer to me as Peter, Lord of the Skies. <laughs> now here's the thing about transparency. I never expected them to do that. I, come on, I don't expect them to do that. But you know what would have been nice? After they got 100 of these, or 150 of these. I would have loved a phone call from one of their marketing people. Peter Shaman, yeah, hi, okay, listen, asshole, we're never gonna do that. <laughs> Just something to tell me they were listening. Because if I'm going out of my way to answer 250 surveys in a row, almost three times a week, and I get no reply from any of them, what does that tell me? And more importantly, what does that tell me when I have a real problem? What if three of my international flights are canceled in a row and I can't get home, right? I'm supposed to, we care, we want to know, but yet what happens if I have a problem? And don't you think for a second, don't you think Delta, American, Virgin, British Airways, don't you think they're all following me online? What happens if all of a sudden I start tweeting out negative things about my experience? You don't think that Delta's going to roll up? Peter, hey, how you doing? Sorry you're having a problem with United. Uh, we'll match your status. We'll give you the same, we'll give you your miles, we have drugs, whatever it is, right? In a half, in a heartbeat. So why would United miss that opportunity to just say, ha, 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 no, we won't, but thanks for writing, we appreciate your business. But nothing. Until my 275th flight. I'm in Orlando, Florida, after a speech. I get to the airport, I start to board, I'm the first person to board. And I beep, and I walk right through, and I hear, I'm halfway down the jetway, and I hear, oh, excuse me, Mr. Shankman? Anytime you're halfway down the jetway and someone calls you back, it's like, I'm going to jail. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, what I do? I start walking back slowly with my hands up, like, I'm going to get shot. She goes, Mr. Shankman, I'm sorry, um, excuse me, are you Peter, Lord of the Skies? <laughs> I lost my shit. We were 35 minutes late for that flight because I was Instagram. I grabbed people off the ramp. I grabbed the baggage guys. We're all taking pictures. It was incredible, right? But it shouldn't have taken 275 emails and a speech to get there. Transparency simply means owning it when you screw up and listening to your audience. They will tell you what they want, which brings me to rule two, which is relevance. The reason that I had such high open rates on Harrow every single day was because I didn't waste anyone's time. The Harrow was exactly the same. It was always text, never graphics. You could read it on any computer, any format. It was always delivered at exactly the same time, 5.35 a.m., 12.35 a.m., 5.35 p.m., three times a day. You could set your watch. People would tweet, if it wasn't out by 5.40, is the Harrow coming out? Was I kicked off the list? What happened? I had someone who told me once, I really don't like the morning harrow because when I'm coming home from the club and I see it, it means that it's morning and I should have been in bed hours ago. It was always the same. Here's the thing about relevance. Relevance can make you a lot of money. How many of you get your news from blogs? I know the entire second row does. How many get your news from like podcasts? How about radio? Remember radio? Satellite. TV, anyone? My ex-wife swears by like the Today Show and everything. She can't tell you what's going on in like North Korea, but if it has to do with K-pop, all over that. Um, newspapers, anyone? I still love my Sunday Times, I read it, yeah, okay. So, web, Twitter, right? Every one of you raise your hand for something different. In 1955, we got our news two ways. The newspaper in the morning that was delivered to your door, and the nightly newscast in the evening. That was it. Radio 
was for an emergency. The first time radio hit mass popularity was when President Kennedy was shot. People wheeled these massive radios into their offices. The average age of the nightly news viewer in 1955 was 37 years old, and 61% of the country watched the nightly news at least three times a week. The average age of the nightly news viewer today, anywhere in the world, anyone want to guess? 60, 80, dead. <laughs> we don't watch the nightly news anymore, we use it as filler. We get home, we take our phones out of our pockets, we put them on the charger, it's the first time we haven't had our phone all day. We go to the bathroom, we brush our teeth, wash our face, we look at our phone to make sure nothing blew up, but we turn on the nightly news just in case. We come out of the bathroom, we shut off the nightly news, we go back to our phones and we fall asleep. No one watches the news anymore. What does matter though, is that people are still getting the same information and even more of it. But if they're not getting it through those only two sources, how are they getting it? I get up ridiculously early. I'm usually up around 4 a.m. to exercise every morning because that's how I handle my ADHD. Certainly not to lose weight, it's because how I handle my ADHD. So I get up and I either, I'm on my, my bike, I have a Peloton bike, or I'm running. And on the days that I'm running, I'm in Central Park, uh, running the Central Park Loop like, three times a week maybe, and I'm listening to podcasts that I downloaded the night before. That's how I get my news. You get your news from blogs, TV, radio, print, newspaper. Everyone gets it differently. Your audience, as a matter of fact, if you Google me, I'm the guy that actually got arrested for running in Central Park, quote unquote, before it opened. I've lived in New York all my life. I had no idea that you could actually get it. There's a curfew, apparently. Which I understand it so you don't stay in the park late. It shouldn't be so you can't go early and exercise. And the cop's like, what are you doing? It's like the middle of February. I'm in spandex. I'm sweating. I'm like, hooking. What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> Never something good to say to a cop, just FYI. But <laughs> long story short, I get my news on podcasts because that's the only way I understand how to. That's the only time I have during the day. I don't have time to read a newspaper. I read the Sunday Times, but other than that, I don't have time. You all get your news differently. What does that mean for your audience? Here's the thing about an audience, guys. Having an audience, whether it's a social audience or a consumer audience that buys stuff from you, whatever it is, having an audience is a privilege. It's not a right. Write that down. I can't stress that enough, guys. Having an audience is a privilege, not a right. It, you know, it's like, it's like wearing spandex. There are about five people in this audience, and I'm not one of them, who have the right to wear spandex. The majority of us, we earn that privilege working out, and as soon as the race that we're doing is over, we have to take it off. Someone comes over to me, sir, you have to put on this big t-shirt. Okay, fine, I get that. It's a privilege. Having an audience is a privilege. If you do not understand how your audience likes to get their information, they will not stick around. So how do you learn how your audience likes to get their info? It's very simple, guys. Ask them. Ask your audience how they prefer to get their information. Give it to them the way they want. When, it's, when you ask an audience member, hey, I'm just curious, do you prefer text? Can we email you? What's, what's better for you? And then send them information that's targeted to them towards their needs where you're not trying to sell them anything, you create an invested customer. An invested customer is 2.5 times more likely to buy and three times more likely to share because they feel like you care about them because you asked them and then did what they wanted. We did it all the time with Harrow, and if you don't believe that works, I sit on the board of an animal rescue society, a nonprofit animal, you know, they, they, they save homeless pets in the Midwest. I discovered them because my friend of mine was killed in a base jump. I'm a, I'm a skydiver. In my spare time, I jump out of planes. And a friend of mine was killed in a base jump about 10 years ago or so. And her husband said, you know, instead of sending flowers or whatever, donate to this animal rescue center. And I sent them a check. Like I said, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And they sent me a coffee table book, like a big book as a thank you of all the animals. I didn't own a coffee table, right? I looked at this thing once and put it in the corner. It didn't fit on my bookshelf. I threw it in a corner. Every day I'd have to look at this book as I was leaving the house that I know took time, effort, money to print and mail. And I was starting to get angry. I'm like, why would they waste their money that I sent them on this book instead of sending it to the animals? And so I called them. I get their like, head of giving on the phone or something. And I said, I'm just curious, why would you send me this book? Well, sir, most of our donors are older and we believe they prefer printed. Oh, okay, you've done your research. I I'm sorry, I stand corrected, not a problem. Well, no, sir, we're just assuming because they're older. I'm like, God damn it. So I joined their board because that's what you do when you get angry with companies, you, you join their board. And over the next year, 
But here's, here's the funny, don't laugh at this. Over the next year, we interviewed every current and past donor to this animal, animal rescue society. 92% of them said they'd prefer to get their information online. So in one year, between 2008 and 2009, we created a Facebook page, a YouTube channel, a Flickr, do you remember Flickr? A Flickr channel, um, a Twitter account, email newsletters. By 2010, donations went up 37% in a 12-month period. And they saved over $500,000 on printing, mailing, and reproduction. Imagine going to your boss or just looking, going to your accountant and saying, yeah, we, we, we increased revenues by 37% and saved a half million dollars. Simply by listening. Rule two is relevance. Be relevant to your audience. Give them the information they want the way they want it. They will love you and tell people about you. Rule three is the concept of brevity. And this is where, the, this is where I get to have fun with the under 30s. Um, raise your hand again if you're under 30. What's your name? What is it? Anya. All right. Anya, I'm going to tell you a story. Anya, all the way back in the 80s, okay, all the way back in the 80s, a bunch of guys got together and they said, we want to take the songs that you hear on the radio. Radio is like Spotify before the internet. Okay. Said, <laughs> you never know. So we want to take these songs you hear on the radio and we want to make little, little movies about these songs, right, Anya? And, and we're going to call these movies videos, right? And we're actually going to create a television network a channel to play these videos of these songs. And they called that channel MTV, or Music Television. Now, I know that, Anya, I know this is really weird to you, because as long as you've been alive, MTV has been a reality channel, right? But if there are children of the 80s in the audience here, you, you'll, back, you'll back me up on this. Before, like, uh, uh, Snooki or, or Lindsay Lohan's Beach, or I'm 13 and pregnant, whatever that crap is, that, before this stuff, right? God forbid you were in our way on a Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. as we were trying to get home for the world premiere video from Madonna, right? Madonna's like um, Lady Gaga with children, right? <laughs> God forbid you were in our way. That was our life. That was all we knew was the world premiere videos, MTV, 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 Yo! MTV, raps, everything. That was all we did. But there were people in Congress and in the White House and things like that who didn't like that. Tipper Gore, um, Ed Meese, who was the Attorney General under Ronald Reagan, he actually held Senate and House subcommittee hearings on what he called the dumbing down of America. Because he believed that Americans were getting stupider because of the MTV. Pro tip, anytime someone in power puts the word the in front of something that doesn't need it, the Twitter, the MTV, question it. So he believed we were getting stupider because of the MTV, and he held hearings on this. Now, here's the thing. He believed that we were getting stupider because MTV was giving us a three-minute attention span. <laughs> Squirrel, I look around the room. I look around the room right now. There is not one person here not on a phone, on a computer. I'm surprised someone doesn't have a desktop display out. Everyone here is digitized and connected. I would give my right arm to speak to an audience with a three-minute attention span. That would be the highlight of my life. <laughs> my child, my six-year-old child, her name, is in, her name is Jessa, but that's not really her name. Because when she's watching whatever she, uh, 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 I got her into Jimmy Neutron. When she's watching Jimmy Neutron, or she's playing Pokemon on her, on her Switch, it's not Jessa, her name becomes Jessa. Jessa, Jessa! That's her name. Because we don't have three-minute attention spans anymore. According to a study that came out several years ago, the average attention span for a consumer between the ages of 18 and 45 who has never heard of your brand before is eight seconds. Anyone else? Three seconds. Closer. 2.7. You have 2.7 seconds to reach your audience for the very first time before they go somewhere else. So if you have 2.7 seconds to reach your audience, that's roughly 140 characters. Now, I need, I need, you gotta give me, give me this. I need two minutes for a rant. What's 140 characters? Wrong! It's a goddamn text message and don't forget it and here's why. Twitter's a pipe. If it hadn't been for one very large orange-haired man, Twitter would have been dead two years ago. Mobile is the future. Mobile is here and mobile is where we're going. Twitter is a pipe. Twitter has been very good to me. Not denying that. I'm very happy. I'm, I have my audience. But there's no need for it. 
Mobile is the future. And the reason I bring that up is because too many people embrace the concept, or embrace the brand, not the concept. Embrace the concept, not the brand. The concept is mobile messaging in short bursts. 140 characters, 160 characters, that's mobile. Twitter's a pipe. When I worked at AOL, I saw people bringing in $50 million wire transfers to 10 years worth of AOL advertising. That didn't go too well. Understand that that pipe can disappear at any time. The future is mobile. And here's why. There are two reasons in the United States, at least in the United States, that we got, that we understood mobile messaging. There were two reasons, two things happened in the United States that taught us that our phones could do more than just make phone calls. Anyone know what those two reasons were? Two things happened. 9-11, good. And the other one? The first episode of American Idol. Here's why you're laughing, but here's why that's true. Because on the first episode of American Idol, no one had ever texted before in the US. And they said, text your vote to 47474, or whatever it was, right? So what happened that night? The show aired, 750,000 people in America dialed 47474, hit send, and then shouted, Kelly Clarkson! <laughs> and every cell phone network in America crashed at the exact same time. If you go on YouTube and you look for the second episode of American Idol, it starts with Ryan Seacrest going, hey, welcome back to American Idol. Before we start, let's do a five-minute primer on how to send a text message. Because every cell phone network was going to sue them if they didn't do that. So those two things taught us that our phones could do more than make calls. And if, if I speak from experience when I say this, on September 11, 2001, I was third for takeoff on the runway at Newark Airport on a United Airlines flight heading to the West Coast when the first tower was hit. I was 10 flights behind Flight 93. I watched, the towers, I watched the first tower fall from the window of my plane. All my parents knew at that time was that their only child was on a United flight taking off from Newark to the West Coast around that time. All I knew is that both my parents were at teaching at NYU about a half a mile from the World Trade Center about that time. I couldn't get through to them, they couldn't get through to me. An hour and a half after the second tower fell, I was off the plane, we never took off, and I was able to send a text message to my father's phone that read, not my plane. And that's how my parents knew I was alive. And that was the first time my parents had ever sent to receive the text message. And it was the era of the flip phone, the, the Nokia flip phone. And I just imagined my father opening this phone, seeing the text mail icon, confusing it with the voicemail. I don't have a voicemail. How do I get rid of this thing? Why won't it work? He figured it out, and that was the first time my parents ever, ever, ever texted. It's been 19, it's gonna be 19 years. I, I, can't, I can't get them to stop texting me. <laughs> it's not funny, sir. No, it's, no. They went to Asia about six months ago, and it was like I was there. And it was like I was there 12 hours in the future, because from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. every, it's a Japanese dog, it's a Japanese tree, it's a Japanese, mom, it's, I, I, no, over there, you're in, no, everything's, the baby's fine. In Japan, they just call it food. You don't need to say it's Japanese, because you're in, right, okay, love you, but they get texting. God knows, I, I, five minutes before I went on stage, my mom, my mom woke up. She's like, what's this thing on the calendar where you're taking Jess? She has school that, mom, I, I'm going on, I need, I love you, bye. They don't get Twitter. Okay, they follow me on Twitter because they want to know what I'm talking about. But if I say something self-deprecating, my mother calls me to discuss the tweet. That's like my going to your house to see if you got the FedEx. The reason I bring this up, guys, understand your audience, right? Texting is a pipe. Mobile is the future. Understand where your audience is. To get back to 2.7 seconds, how does that relate? If you have 2.7 seconds or one paragraph of text to reach your audience, become a better communicator. Stop making the stupid-ass mistakes that we all make that turns someone off to your business. Learn to spell. If you speak in front of audiences, if you sell, take an improvisation class. Whatever it is, become a better communicator. Here's, the, here's a scary test. Now, I don't know if this is true here. It's probably not, but it's true in the United States. Look to your left and look to your right. One out of every two corporate home pages in the United States of America has a spelling or grammatical error on the home page. If it's not the person to your left or the right, it's your ass. How can I trust you? How can I trust you? Why would I read past 100 characters if the fourth word is misspelled? And this involves everything you do. I told you my daughter's name is Jessa. It's a little interesting name. It's not, it's not your typical name. 
<clears throat> being a single dad, I'm very protective of her. When she's nine months old, I took her to uh, this daycare thing. It's a Kidville, right? They take your kid for three hours. As far as I can tell, they take the kid for three hours a day. They throw him in a rubber ball pit. Three hours later, they pull them out and give them back to you. But the first day I'm there, I'm really scared. I bring Jessa over. They're, I'm like, should I stay? No, sir, you can go. I'm like, I don't want to go. They're like, please go. I leave. I come back three hours later. Jessa's fine. She's ah, all happy. I'm like, all right, great. I'll bring her back again tomorrow. I get an email from them that night. Dear Mr. Shankman, just want to say thank you so much for trusting us with your daughter and want to follow up with you. It was such a pleasure to have Jessica. <laughs> Jessa. There's a term in America called nonlinear. It basically means losing your shit. The next day I come back, I hand Jess a little worker who throws her in the ball pit. I go, hi, um, <laughs> you had one fucking job. How can I trust you to watch this kid when you can't spell my daughter's name right? Oh, well, it's copying, you know, it's a spell check. I don't give a shit if a dinosaur came down and made you misspell it while breathing fire. That's my kid. Right? How can I trust you to do anything if you can't spell? How can I trust you to do anything if you can't get my name right? And guys, if you're doing PR for your companies, let me just put it this way. It was Mother's Day in the U.S. three weeks ago. About a month ago, I got an email. Dear Peter, we get it. Moms like you have it hard. I don't need you guys to be awesome. I need you to suck slightly less. Know my gender. I identify as a guy. Even if I didn't, Peter's pretty much a man. Just understand your audience. Be slightly better. That's rule three. That's brevity. Rule four, here's how I'm going to wrap it up. And this is what this all comes down to. Do the first three things, and then rule four is easy. Rule four is top of mind. What does top of mind mean? Top of mind means that you are the first thing people think about when they want to buy the things that you sell. How do you get there? In the 1970s, there was a, a, a company called Paramount Pictures. Paramount Pictures needed a new CEO, and they tapped a guy named Barry Diller. Barry Diller was an agent. Everyone said, don't take this job. Paramount, Paramount is two feet from bankruptcy. It's a mistake. He went to Paramount Pictures anyway, and he did two things. Between 1976 and 1987, he did two things that his predecessor didn't do. He got into the office an hour early, and he called 10 random people a day out of his Rolodex. Okay, Rolodex is like Outlook, but it had cards, and you'd turn it to get the... Okay, so we'd call these people in his Rolodex, and every day, he'd call 10 people. Hey, it's Barry. What are you working on? How can I help? How can I help are the, most, are the four most underutilized words in the world. Why? Because we call people to sell them. We bother people to sell them. We get this all the time, right? How many times do we get an email from someone you haven't talked to in five years? Peter, hey, so good to catch up. So I'm looking for a new job. How about just buy me a drink first, right? All I need you to understand is this. When you reach out to people when you don't have anything to sell, when they have something that they want to buy, they will remember you. Between 1977 and 1986 and 1987, Barry Diller was responsible and Paramount were responsible for such movies as Beverly Hills Cop, Officer and a Gentleman, Three Men and a Baby, um, uh, 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 Fast Times at Rich all these movies. Paramount went from two feet from bankruptcy to the first billion dollar studio in the world. Barry reached out and just said hi. Now granted, this was 1976 in the early 80s, so there's probably a lot of cocaine too, but those things created the first billion dollar studio in Hollywood. So those are the four rules, transparency, relevance, brevity, and top of mind. That's how I sold, started and sold the business in under three years from my couch with two overweight cats for a lot of money. And the beauty of it is it wasn't hard and I didn't even realize I was doing it. Just be one level above crap. I'm gonna tell you my favorite joke and I'm done. Two guys are in the woods on a trail run. Right, and they're training for marathon. They're running in the woods and they're like mile eight and they're sweating and they're having a great time but they're in the middle of nowhere and they see a bear. And it's a big ass black bear and the black bear sees them and he stands up and he raises his claws and the guys are like, oh, we're dead. And the first guy's like, oh my God. And he leans down, he tightens up his trainers, his running shoes, tightens up his running shoes a little, a little tighter, right? And the second guy says, dude, what, what are you crazy? You can't outrun a bear? The first guy says, no, 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 I, I just need to outrun you. <laughs> I don't need you guys to be awesome. I need to be one level above. My name is Peter Shankman, guys, that's me, thank you.